There is something spine-chillingly delightful about being truly scared by a good ghost story. Whether it be headless horsemen, menacing monks, poltergeist, phantom or apparition, the great British tradition of dark tales recounted around a flickering fire is as irresistible today as ever. Science may offer a myriad of explanations, but nothing can equal the thrill of a mystery and the adrenaline rush of fear. Believer and skeptic alike stop and listen to narratives embellished by generations of storytellers until it becomes impossible to separate fact from fiction. Like many who have an interest in ghosts, my earliest recollections come from childhood when at the tender age of eight I moved to Maryfield House in Cornwall. Looking at the red sandstone tower, I still feel a chill, remembering the hours spent sleepless in my turret bedroom. As a young tearaway, with a mother who adhered to the belief that sparing the rod spoiled the child, the place seemed a torture chamber, where punishment was liberally meted out for the good of my soul. Perhaps it was unhappiness, and a general atmosphere of terror that precipitated the ghostly noises and the certain knowledge that I was not alone in my dark prison. But returning as an adult to what has since become a happy home, I am convinced that this house has a spiritual presence beyond my own miserable memories. However, there's an ironic twist to my days in this house, with my tenure marked as an indelible part of Maryfield's history. My naval officer father returned from one tour of duty with a gift for his errant son. It was a small oval china plaque, hand-painted with the words William's Room over a picture of a ship at sea. This was duly fixed to my bedroom door, and quite unbeknown to me, it was left behind when my family departed. Whether an attempt to exorcise the past, or discover more about this fascinating house with a church in its front garden, when I return to Cornwall, I often drive past to look at the old place. About ten years ago, I stopped and the house had been sold. Builders were working there, and I was amazed to find that they had been terrified by the ghost of William, said to be the illegitimate child of local gentry, hidden away in Maryfield's tower where he had died. I asked how they knew his name, and they replied that an old china plaque saying William's room with a ship at sea remained upon his bedroom door a tragic memorial to the little lost boy. It was an eerie feeling. Legend had made me a ghost in my own lifetime, and I was fascinated at how the story had grown. The stories featured in Ghostly Trails have all evolved with time, just as the tale of William's room. Some stand up to investigation, with others perhaps owing more to fiction than fact. I can tell you for certain that the haunting China name plaque once belonged to me. But as for the rest of the ghosts, you'll have to decide for yourselves.
the beautiful village of Chawton in Hampshire is the epitome of peaceful rural England, and the ghost that has been reported passing through its quiet streets with a rustle of silk and a humorous whisper is none other than Jane Austen, one of the greatest writers of all time. Chawton Cottage, the substantial red brick house at the heart of the village was home to Jane Austen between July 1809 and May 1817. She came to the house full of hope and expectation at the age of 33 with her older sister Cassandra and widowed mother. Both Jane and Cassandra had been unlucky in love and were very possibly already resigned to the fact that they would never marry. Britain had been at war with France since 1793, and with eligible men in short supply, Jane turned her attention to writing. All six of her novels were completed here at this little table. Jane would work quietly at her manuscripts, but she insisted that the door to the parlour, disturbingly creaky, was never to be oiled. This way, when visitors approached, she was warned of their arrival, allowing time to hide her writing from prying eyes. Despite the growing popularity of Sense and Sensibility, Pride and Prejudice, Mansfield Park and Emma, during Jane's lifetime, few people knew the identity of the author. When Sense and Sensibility was first published, the title page simply said, By a Lady, and the subsequent novels were attributed to the author of Sense and Sensibility. Consequently, Jane lived an unremarkable, quiet country life with Cassandra, her close companion, never wealthy, but certainly content with her lot. As was the fashion of the day, visits were made to London, Bath and the seaside, but whenever Jane and Cassandra were parted, the two sisters would write to each other, often daily. The surviving letters, many safely preserved at Chawton, paint a vivid picture of Jane Austen's character and the life she led. The eight short years Jane Austen spent at Chawton were almost idyllically happy until she became ill with what was most probably cancer. There was little help for the terrible pain she suffered and eventually she could only move around the village by means of her donkey cart. Still hopeful of a cure, Jane moved to Winchester to be closer to the eminent surgeon who was treating her condition. Sadly, Jane deteriorated rapidly, and she died in Cassandra's arms on the 18th of July, 1817, at the age of 41. Jane Austen is buried in Winchester Cathedral, her final resting place, marked by a simple stone slab in the North Isle of the cathedral nave. Mrs. Austin and Cassandra remained at Chawton Cottage for the rest of their lives, and they are buried side by side in the little village churchyard. The house then became a farm dwelling until it was bought in 1947 as a memorial to Lieutenant Philip Carpenter who had been killed in action in 1944. With the help of the Jane Austen Society, Chawton Cottage was restored and opened as a museum in 1949. Jane Austen's house has since become a unique and amazingly intimate experience for the thousands of visitors who come to Chawton each year. Many have reported feeling that Jane Austen herself is just about to walk into a room, an atmosphere that at times can be quite overwhelming. Unlike other ghost stories, full of malevolence and darkness, the tales of Jane's ghost here at Chawton are delightful, 
rather than dreading an encounter with the great lady spirit, most would consider it a rare privilege. Skeptics might look at the house with each room restored in the manner that Jane would instantly recognise, full of her own very personal possessions, and put her presence down to the power of suggestion. There's a handwritten manuscript book containing her favourite music. Jane's copy of Lover's Vows, which she immortalised in Mansfield Park and the beautiful amber crosses given to Jane and Cassandra by their brother Charles, to mention but a few. What's more, the items in the display cabinets are not replicas, with the originals kept in safety deposit boxes. They are the books she read, music she played and jewellery that she wore. The very essence of Jane Austen is everywhere for everyone to enjoy. Reports of ghostly happenings include footsteps heard upstairs in the house when no one is there, floorboards creaking and doors opening and shutting of their own accord. Occasionally people are convinced that someone has just passed them by in the garden on the stairs, in fact all around the house and through the village as well. This never appears to cause any alarm as there is a great sense of peace prevailing whenever such events take place. In Jane's formative years, the great Gothic novel was in its heyday. Stories of trembling heroines encountering the supernatural in dark, ivy-clad castles were very popular, and Jane Austen positively revelled in the ridiculous plots of these early tales of terror. When Jane wrote Northanger Abbey, which is a gentle spoof of all the worst absurdities of the Gothic novel, she certainly created a mysterious atmosphere, despite her playful sense of satire. Readers are treated to outlandish suspicions about skeletons in closets, tragic family secrets and danger lurking around every corner for her naive young heroine with an overactive imagination. Jane Austen builds a tale with all the twists and turns of a modern day horror film, only to smash the entire illusion with down to earth reality and common sense. In life, Jane Austen was a well-practiced observer of the people around her, with a sharp ear for their conversation, providing herself with hours of entertainment and inspiration. Ironic to think that her spirit may still linger in the fabric of Chawton Cottage, where she can continue this favourite pastime as future generations come to visit the place where she once lived. There was a more serious side to Jane Austen's character and her loving devotion to her sister Cassandra is well documented and it's perhaps this closeness in life that may explain another reported encounter with Jane Austen's ghost. A member of the museum staff was busy at work one quiet morning transcribing some of Cassandra's letters. She knew she was completely alone but settled happily to her task after collecting a cup of coffee. Engrossed in the 200-year-old correspondence, she heard a noise outside, which she put down to someone walking into the courtyard. A few moments later, she glanced out of the window, but no one was there. Unconcerned, she returned to the letters, and almost immediately heard the noise again. By this time, she was listening carefully, and the next sound she heard was an almost indistinguishable whisper that was little more than a hiss. Then she clearly heard a woman's voice softly calling. It took her a few moments to realise that what had at first sounded like a hiss was in fact the name Cass. 
This happened a few more times and then stopped as suddenly as it had begun. The feeling that someone else was in the house with her had melted away. Returning to Cassandra's letters, the lady continued with her work, convinced that she had not been the only one that morning reading the words written by a beloved sister. Clearwell Caves, set deep below the Royal Forest of Dean and rolling Gloucestershire countryside, have been mined for iron ore since the ancient Britons first discovered mineral deposits here in the 5th century BC. As the surface ore dwindled, forest miners tunnelled deeper and deeper underground in search of the precious compound eventually creating a vast mining complex with thousands of caverns and miles of passageways covering a 600-acre site. For the many visitors who come to Clearwell Caves each year, the experience can be quite literally breathtaking, and once underground, the sights, sounds and smells of the authentically preserved mine workings are truly thrilling. Every drip of water and passing footstep is amplified and shadows dance on the beautifully lit rock formations, enlarged beyond all recognition. Hardly surprising then that many ghostly happenings have been reported deep down in the dark caverns, but the oldest of these ghost stories is persistently consistent. The miners at Clearwell have always talked about an old man who haunts the mine. Descriptions of his clothing are always the same in every detail, including his soft felt hat. It's hard to put a date on the type of costume he's wearing because miners' dress change little over many centuries. The free miner brass, which has become synonymous with Clearwell Caves, dates from the 14th century, but when it's compared to this line drawing from about 1850, the clothing is almost identical. As an interesting point, they're not smoking pipes as it may at first appear. The men are using a small ball of clay known as a nelly which was used to hold a candle and in turn was secured by means of a stick between the miners' teeth. This was the only light source for the miners underground and although a touch uncomfortable, it allowed them to work hands-free. Miners used their candles wisely as even for the experienced, it was almost impossible for anyone to find their way out of the caves in the dark. It's been in just such circumstances that the old man has appeared, helping to guide those who are lost back up to the surface. This benevolent spirit has also materialised in more recent years. Children are of course fascinated by caves, and when a local boy was reported missing and friends said he had been seen playing near an entrance to the mine, a huge search was mounted. Several days went by with no sign of him, but just as hope was beginning to fade, the child appeared at the cave's entrance. He was cold, hungry and extremely frightened, having existed in complete darkness for so many hours, but otherwise none the worse for being underground. 
When asked how he'd found his way out, he simply told his would-be rescuers that a kind old man had shown him which path to take and he then pointed to the Clearwell Cave sign saying that that was the man who had saved him. The caves were bought by the present owner, Ray Wright, during the 1960s when he first saw the potential for a unique mining museum in the Forest of Dean. Today, the footsteps and voices of visitors can be heard throughout the main caverns, confirming Ray's belief that people would get a true sense of mining life from first-hand experience. Many thousands have passed this way, and Ray has heard often of the old man appearing. But perhaps the most fascinating involves a television crew, and some 25 years on, the mystery still remains unexplained. For the television and film industries that have flourished so extensively since Ray Wright first acquired Clearwell Caves, the site has proved to be a very popular dramatic location. With the advent of digital technology, film crews now often operate with as little as a two-man team, but this was a very different story back in the 1970s. Clearwell Caves had been booked for a shoot, and the film company duly arrived with all of their associated paraphernalia. Lighting was going to be the major headache, as unlike today, there was no main supply into the caves. A generator was the obvious answer, but it was impossible to get the large bulky contraption down into the depths. The lighting crew spent an entire day laying cables through the main passageways, fortunately strong burly guys well able to manage the heavy equipment of the time. Filming began. Cameramen, sound people, directors, actors, makeup, engineers and various assistants all frantically trying to get the best results from a challenging environment. Time really was money with so many people involved, and when the lighting, so carefully planned, did not produce the right effect, the tension mounted. There was nothing for it. The lighting crew would have to lay yet more cable, so they set off towards the surface. It was at this point that the old man appeared. Thinking that he was a mine tour guide in traditional costume, they asked him which was the shortest route back up to the top to lay cable. He led them to this tiny tunnel entrance, a daunting prospect for large lighting guys, each over six feet tall and well fed at outside broadcast catering trucks. Although there was no way they could see where the tunnel was going to come out, if it did at all, they followed the old man squeezing through the confined space. Eventually they emerged into a small cavern, which in turn led them out onto the main pathway almost at the surface. The short cut had saved them over 30. Gratefully, they turned to thank the old man, but he was nowhere to be seen. Hurrying to finish the task in hand, they decided to look for him again later. With lighting quickly set to new satisfactory levels, the day's filming was soon completed. It was only when everything was packed and ready to go that the lighting guys remembered the old man and tried to find him. When he didn't appear to be anywhere around, they popped into the office and asked that their thanks be passed on to him. The people in the office looked completely blank, explaining that there had been no one else in the mine that day other than those involved with the film. Intrigued, the lighting guys took everyone to where the old man had led them, convinced that it would have been impossible to find if they hadn't been shown where to look. When asked to describe the man, they could remember very little, only his miner's tunic and soft felt hat. 
but and although they were convinced that he'd spoken to them, they couldn't recollect his words. Having had the opportunity to follow the story to its exact location, it's almost incredible that two large men who didn't know the mine at all would choose to squeeze through such a confined tunnel without any guarantee of ever being able to get out again. A mystery indeed, and one that has become a much-loved addition to the folklore of Clearwell Caves. There is something about the traditional English manor house that exudes historical atmosphere, and Chavenage near the unspoiled Cotswold town of Tetbury is a classic example. Predominantly Elizabethan in style, the house actually dates back to before the 14th century, with links to an ancient priory which stood at Horsley, just a few miles away. A sweeping drive leads to an impressive entrance, where a heavy wooden door creaks open to admit visitors to the house. Once inside, there is without doubt a ghostly atmosphere, and further investigation reveals a collection of spirits associated with Chavenage which spans the centuries. The house has been in the family of the present owner, David Lousley Williams, since the 1500s, and the most famous Chavenage ghost story involves his ancestor, Colonel Nathaniel Stevens, who was in residence here when the Civil War broke out in 1642. A distant relation of Oliver Cromwell and an MP, Nathaniel was a supporter of the parliamentarian cause. When Charles I and the Royalist army was defeated at the Battle of Naseby in 1645, there was much speculation about what should happen to the vanquished king. Oliver Cromwell has gone down in history as a brilliant but ruthless leader, and he was determined that the king should be put on trial and executed as quickly as possible. Nathaniel Stevens was moderate in his views and was against such a course of action because, like many others, he believed that Charles I, although a bad king, was in fact a good man, deserving better treatment than he was receiving at the hands of his captors. Nathaniel refused to give his support and eventually Oliver Cromwell arrived in person at Chavenage to persuade him. The room in which Cromwell slept has been preserved and visitors can see the actual bed where the great man passed the night. A copy of Charles I's death warrant is also in the room. A chilling reminder that Cromwell crushed all opposition with the king eventually beheaded on the 30th of January 1649. The room is covered in heavy tapestries and even on warm days is always cold. Footsteps have been frequently heard coming from the room when it's known to be empty and on one occasion a guest using this room inexplicably upped and left in the middle of the night. With bags hastily packed the lady in question walked seven miles to Kemble Station alone through the dark country lanes, refusing to ever disclose what had happened to her the night she slept in Oliver Cromwell's bed. But back to Nathaniel Stevens, his daughter Abigail was horrified that her father had failed to stand firm against Cromwell, 
She was convinced that the family would be forever cursed as a result of his weakness, and when Nathaniel became ill soon afterwards, Abigail was sure that her fears had been justified. The legend that has grown around these events claims that as Nathaniel breathed his last, a magnificent phantom coach and horses drew up at the front of the house. If the coachman dressed in the royal livery of Charles I, eerily headless, sat motionless as the ghost of Nathaniel Stevens entered the coach. With great speed it then raced over the cobbled drive with a tremendous roar, and as it reached the manor gates the apparition burst into flames before disappearing completely from sight. What's more, the legend also claims that any lord of the manor who actually dies in the house will be transported to the hereafter in the same ghostly style. There are those who talk of seeing the spectre of a carriage driven by a headless coachman pulling up to the house at the dead of night, and also those that are convinced that they've heard ghostly carriage wheels thundering down the driveway when there's not a vehicle of any description in sight. A strange story indeed. But other visitors to Chavenage have been surprised by equally bizarre supernatural experiences. Another famous guest to frequent Chavenage was Princess Marie Louise, a granddaughter of Queen Victoria. Her lady-in-waiting was woken one night to see the ghost of a woman dressed in fine grey clothing. The spirit floated over to the bed where the princess lay sleeping. Bent her head, appearing to closely look at Marie Louise, before leaving the room as stealthily as she had entered it. When the lady in waiting told her story the next morning to the rest of the household, nobody seemed in the least bit troubled, as the grey lady had been encountered many times. The princess didn't see the ghostly figure. But for all the time that she stayed in that particular room, she complained of the door opening and closing for no apparent reason. A room in the newer part of the house was also exorcised at the same time that the priest was called in to the Oliver Cromwell room. On a number of occasions, a very strange ghost appeared, waking guests in the middle of the night. A swarthy man, dressed in military uniform, with heavy gold braid epaulettes materialised, a mysterious character, with long black hair and swirling black moustache, who he was or why he should be there, has never been discovered. One of the most beautiful and unique features of Chavenage is the little Catholic chapel where the family still worship today. Built some years after Henry VIII's dissolution of the monasteries when the Augustinian monks at Horsley had been forced to flee the priory. This may well explain why one resident of Chavenage had real problems with things going bump in the night. Each night she was disturbed from her sleep by something banging into her bed. And when it was realised that the bed was in front of a door that had long ago been a priest's cell, the solution was simple. The bed was moved to another part of the room, the exit for the spirit cleared, and peace was thankfully restored. There's no official clergyman attached to the chapel, and when Mass is to be celebrated, a visiting priest will officiate. Quite recently, a priest that was due to take Sunday morning Mass was invited to stay at the house on the Saturday night. Not knowing the chapel, he decided to take a look around. When the priest walked in, he stayed very quietly at the back, because a monk with a high cowl was knelt in prayer at the altar rail. The monk didn't even look up from his devotions, and when the priest left to go back to the house, 
the monk still didn't move. At dinner, the priest asked where the monastery was and was surprised to hear that there wasn't one in the vicinity. When he told his story, the family just smiled because many other visitors had reported the ghostly figure of a monk walking in the grounds, but up until this occasion, the spirit has always disappeared at the entrance to the chapel. There's something undeniably romantic about the unspoiled fishing village of Polpero in Cornwall. Admittedly, when it's besieged by tourists in the summer months, it can be harder to feel the true sense of timelessness. But with the narrow streets kept free of traffic, the atmosphere at least retains a flavour of the past. Sheltered in a cliff ravine, a fascinating jumble of fishermen's cottages rise steadily from the harbour. Many were designed almost as a ship made of stone, with a ground floor perfect for storing nets and salted fish and the living accommodation in the loft above. There was a time when the poor of Cornwall relied upon the seasonal pilchard catch to feed them for the entire year. Fishing was a vital part of Cornwall's economy, and combined with mining for tin and copper, it was the regional mainstay. There's a traditional Cornish toast, which can still be heard in pubs today, of fish, tin and copper. However, the rugged Cornish coastline sustained a lucrative black economy with smuggling supplementing the incomes of whole villages. Polpero has often been described as the smuggling capital of the district and it's not difficult to imagine contraband furtively delivered under the cover of nightfall to the cellars and caches of the waiting houses. Ever since the Norman occupation after the Battle of Hastings in 1066, when William the Conqueror put much of Cornwall into the hands of tax-raising absentee landlords, avoiding what was perceived as unfair duty soon became a much-practiced skill as smuggling flourished. As the years went on, and England was constantly at war with France, sometimes Spain and even transatlantic neighbours, piracy on the high seas and raiding parties in search of alcohol and tobacco were often coordinated from Cornwall. No matter how dangerous the hostilities between the nations, the smugglers of Cornwall still braved the elements to bring all manner of goods back to the hidden coves along the shoreline, always careful to avoid the watchful eyes of the customs men. Entire communities would keep the secret of the smugglers, and those not actively involved could be expected to turn away as the horses' hooves were heard on the cobbled streets at the dead of night. A walk through Polpero when darkness has fallen brings Rudyard Kipling's famous Smuggler's Song to mind, which offers very good advice. If you wake at midnight and hear a horse's feet, don't go drawing back the blind or looking in the street. Them that asks no questions isn't told a lie. Watch the wall, my darling, while the gentlemen go by. Five and twenty ponies trotting through the dark, brandy for the parson, backy for the clerk, laces for a lady, letters for a spy. 
Watch the wall, my darling, while the gentlemen go by. Smuggling was a dangerous business because the stakes were high and many an informer was found with his throat cut and the culprits never apprehended. Also, many small boats were wrecked on the wild coast, drowning the occupants and consigning their treasure to the bottom of the sea. There are those who still today claim to hear ghostly screams through Polpero streets of those who died horridly in search of a fortune. From time to time, ships would run aground in stormy weather and local people often lit fires on the clifftops to try and guide a stricken vessel to safety. The precious cargo, whether it be brandy, wine, rum, silk, tobacco or gold, was swiftly collected. But riots frequently broke out as men fought for a share of the spoils. In a poverty-stricken environment where life was cheap, Gangs of wild, hard-drinking Cornishmen, well used to the perilous existence of the mines or at sea, thought nothing of lighting false fires to bring about a disaster. Known as wrecking, their intention was to destroy the ship and steal whatever was in the hold. There was no assistance for the survivors, just rows of men along the beach waiting to drown any soul who reached the shore. Eyewitness reports describe horrendous scenes as hundreds at a time were murdered in the icy cold depths. On a windy night, phantom cries begging for mercy have been reported on many occasions along the stretches of coastline where such unfortunate souls are known to have perished at the hands of the Cornish wreckers. The arrival of John Wesley in Cornwall and his Methodist preaching did much to check such lawless behaviour, but it did take over 40 years for the Methodist connection to reach the distant corners of the county. Today, the coastline is protected by lighthouses, never fading beacons thanks to modern technology. Here at the Eddystone Lighthouse, many shipwrecks lie beneath the swirling waters, and as a dense mist descends from nowhere, the booming foghorn and flashing light are extremely comforting in such eerie surroundings. There are many wonderful ghost stories connected to the sea, tales abound of ghost ships appearing to collect the souls of sailors who have died ashore in the past, more especially, when the deceased happened to have been an old pirate. It's been known for modern-day sailors to avoid crossing water where shipwrecks lie for fear of being haunted by any long-lost souls that they may disturb. As with any other region of the country, the best places for ghost stories are the traditional Cornish pubs that very possibly benefited from the smuggling trade so many years ago. The Crumplehorn Inn at the top of the village of Polpero is a fine example of a haunted hostelry, and as the fires are lit and the night draws in, ghost stories are traded over the well-stocked bar. Nobody knows quite how long there's been a mill on this site, but it was mentioned in the Doomsday Book of 1086 and corn was still ground here until the 1950s. One ghost is by all accounts as fond of the bar as the regulars, with many people claiming to have caught just a glimpse of him out of the corner of their eye. On one occasion, a lady working in the bar turned off the lights and closed up, sure that everyone had left. When the door to the toilets opened, a heavy, stiff sprung door, she quickly apologised, thinking she must have shut someone in. And as she turned around, the door closed as mysteriously as it had opened. She checked everywhere, but found that she was completely alone. 
there's also a bedroom that seems to have an equally strange ghostly presence. It's been thought that a picture of a fisherman is responsible for peculiar happenings, but a number of guests have reported lights switching on and off of their own accord. A lady quietly putting on her makeup saw someone go into the bathroom, but when she went in after them, the room was empty. Later that night, she awoke to find every light on, even the standard lamps. Fortunately, she wasn't troubled, but the story certainly added to the growing legend. A member of staff then spent a night in the room, but when she woke in the early hours to find the lights on, she put it down to the manager playing a joke. This was no prank. He had no part in it, and instead of dispelling the myth, the story was only given greater credence. Whether phantom visitation or elaborate hoax, one thing's for sure. The housekeeping staff service this particular room at the greatest of speed. The quiet rural town of Barclay is shadowed by the majestic grey walls of an imposing Norman castle, one of the finest examples of a medieval stronghold to be found anywhere in the country. Throughout history, refuge has been sought within its protective walls, but for Edward II, one of England's most tragic kings, it was a fortress he could never escape. The murder of Edward II is without doubt Barclay's most notorious claim to fame, and walking around what now appears to be a stately yet very comfortable home gives few clues to the terrible deeds perpetrated under the Barclay family's roof. Don't be fooled by the lavish furnishings, fine paintings and lovely gardens. The ghostly tale that follows has haunted the castle ever since, and will continue to do so for all eternity. Edward II was a deposed monarch when he arrived at Barclay as a prisoner in 1327. His own 14-year-old son Edward III succeeded him, but the real power lay in the hands of the boy's mother, Isabella of France, the wife that Edward II had spurned in favour of homosexual liaisons which were far from discreet. Hell certainly has less fury as Isabella and her lover Roger Mortimer plotted to dispose of the unwanted husband. Thomas, the then Lord Barclay, Mortimer's son-in-law, was happy to oblige the Queen as she restored lands to him that had been plundered by the King's favourites, the Despensers. He was Edward's jailer, sending him up these very steps to the awful dungeon where the King was to die. The dungeon is strategically built above a very deep pit where the castle's putrefied waste would have been allowed to accumulate. As this included everything from sewage to animal carcasses and the occasional troublesome human, the stench of the noxious gases was usually enough to kill anyone left in the dungeon above for long enough. Edward had lived a privileged life and with a strong constitution he survived the perils of the pit for five months but the hours spent in such unpleasant conditions must have taken their toll. 
but worse was to come. An unsuccessful rescue attempt sealed the king's death warrant as a nervous Queen Isabella felt it necessary to speed up proceedings. On the night of the 21st of September 1327, a band of hired killers were let into the castle. He was still a strong man, and there was an almighty struggle as Edward tried to fight off his attackers, but all was in vain. Traditional disembowelment with a red-hot poker. A customary but gruesome death for homosexuals in the 14th century was employed on that fearful night. The screams of the tortured man were heard for miles and although there was not a mark on the twisted corpse, news reaching London, where the influential clergy of the day refused to offer the king's body holy burial. Eventually, the Abbot of Gloucester granted the mortal remains of Edward II a final resting place near the high altar in St Peter's Abbey, now better known as Gloucester Cathedral. Isabella and her lover only ruled for three years, at which time Edward III seized power from his mother. Mortimer was tried and executed, and Isabella was forced to retire from public life. It's claimed that the Barclay family, the 25th generation of which owned the castle today, were away at the time of the murder and were not party to it. Their staunch support of the monarchy in the Civil War, which was to follow many years later, has allegedly been attributed to a sense of guilt. Perhaps. Who can say? Anyone who's heard this dreadful story is unlikely to forget it, and the inhabitants of Barclay who have had the tragic tale passed down through numerous generations will sometimes claim to hear blood-curdling screams at the dead of night coming from a sinister, silhouetted castle. A few anonymous lines of poetry that have also been handed down with the legend suggest that nocturnal peace in Barclay has been disquiet for a very long time. Shrieks that through Barclay's roof did ring, shrieks of an agonising king. A violent death of this type will often precipitate a wealth of ghost stories, with few people who die peacefully in their beds seeming to feature in tales of the paranormal. This second encounter with the ghost of Edward II was reported in more recent times, when a Saturday night out turned into an exceptional experience for a group of local Barclay lads. A plentiful supply of beer in the local hostelry made for a lively walk home and well used to the sight of a large grey castle looming out of the darkness en route, nobody paid any attention to it. Until one man suddenly stopped, his gaze fixed on a large door in the castle wall which had opened. The others too stared in amazement as ancient soldiers on horseback slowly advanced towards them. Foot soldiers then followed as a funeral procession bore a draped coffin on a horse-drawn dray with large wooden wheels out of the castle. Monks with their heads shrouded in dark cowls silently passed by as one monk moved to the front to lead the cortege far beyond where the men stood before disappearing into the distance. Historical accounts of the King's last journey from Barclay to Gloucester bear out what the men described, although in the days that followed even they found it hard to believe what they'd seen. However, many years on, Despite the merciless teasing of those who put the vision down to excess alcohol, 
the men still remain convinced that they witnessed the tragic king's ghostly departure from the confines of the castle. This has been a truly memorable look at ghost stories, giving me the chance to lay one or two ghosts of my own, starting out with the great haunted tower of my childhood at Maryfield House. There are places where I felt a deep sense of mystery, others an overwhelming sadness, sometimes a comfortable acceptance and frequently a healthy degree of cynicism. Overall, I have to say that I have no great explanations to offer and no proof that ghosts actually exist. Equally, I found no evidence to the contrary. However, it's been a fascinating topic that will captivate our mortal imaginations for generations to come. And I, for one, will definitely be off in search of more ghostly trails as soon as I possibly can.